Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to discuss solid hearts. So in a previous video, which should be linked right up here, I showed you how to solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation using the split step Fourier method. Essentially, this equation tells us how the envelope of a pulse changes as it propagates down the fiber when subjected to group velocity dispersion and self phase modulation. In general, we saw that group velocity dispersion would cause the pulse to spread out in the time domain while cell phase modulation causes it to spread out in the frequency domain. And specifically, when beta 2, the parameter that governs the magnitude of um, the group velocity dispersion, is negative, then we get what's called anomalous dispersion, in which case blue light will propagate faster than red light, and we get a, um, not only just the pulse spreading out, but also a blue chip in the front and a red chip in the back. Simultaneously, we saw that cell phase modulation will cause a red chip in the front and a blue chip in the back. So, an interesting question we could ask is, is there some kind of pulse envelope shape we can select where these two effects will cancel out each other exactly, causing the pulse to propagate in a very constant way all the way throughout the fiber without spreading out in either domain? And it turns out there actually is a way to, to do that. So uh, I've posted a full duration of how to determine the functional form of that shape on my GitHub page here, and you can click on it and go through all the, the gory details. But the final conclusion is that we need a pulse that is defined by a hyperbolic secant function, like so. So I thought it might be interesting to investigate this numerically as well as analytically and see how this propagation actually looks. So to do that, I first defined a function here that generates a hyperbolic secant pulse. And then I've defined a function here that actually initializes the pulse as well as the fiber going to propagate through. So we select a pulse duration here and generate a fiber, so split it into a certain number of steps. We specify a gamma value and a negative value of beta 2, because remember we need this to be anomalous for this solid thing to work. Then we specify a characteristic distance here for reasons you'll see in just a moment. And then we create a fiber with a length of 2.5 times this characteristic distance. Then we can initialize it here and then also very carefully select the amplitude of the pulse we want to simulate. So first we create a sort of characteristic amplitude based on the magnitude of the value of uh, the beta 2 as well as the value of gamma and the duration of the pulse. Then we set the amplitude of the pulse to be simply n multiplied by this characteristic amplitude like so. Next we can actually generate the hyperbolic secant pulse and compare it to an equivalent Gaussian pulse and a square pulse. So we see a Gaussian pulse in blue and a square pulse in orange, and then the hyperbolic secant pulse in green. And what we, um, what we notice here is that the Gaussian pulse and the hyperbolic secant pulse seem pretty similar, at least close to the peak. But an important difference is obvious if we look in the log domain instead of the linear domain. Here we can see that the Gaussian pulse looks like a parabola, which is expected because it's defined as e to the negative t squared essentially. And the hyperbolic secant pulse looks like actually straight lines out here in the um, in the log domain. And that's because the hyperbolic secant basically depends on regular exponentials. That's why we get the linear behavior when we take the, the logarithm. So the important thing to keep in mind is that Gaussian pulses um, have much much sort of more low intensity tails than a hyperbolic secant pulse, whose tails are much more uh, intense than the one for the Gaussian here. So it's important to keep in mind for like the, I guess, understanding the geometric difference between the Gaussian pulse and the hyperbolic secant pulse. So with that in mind, let's actually propagate the hyperbolic secant pulse down the length of the fiber and then take a look at the output. So we expect this to be just completely unchanged and indeed that is what we see here, that the initial and final pulse look perfectly identical. And not only that, all the way throughout, the whole fiber will get the exact same, um, the exact same pulse shape propagating all the way down, which in a way is a bit miraculous. Because remember, we have both dispersion that causes it to spread out in the time domain and cell phase rotation that can cause a lot of like unexpected things to happen in the spectral domain. But somehow for this particular pulse shape, those two effects cancel each, out, each other out exactly. At least when we select a pulse amplitude with n equal to one. But what actually happens if we boost this up to maybe n equal to two? So remember for n equal to one, those two effects of group relative dispersion that's negative and cell phase rotation exactly balance each other out. But now with a high amplitude, we have more cell phase rotation. So what's gonna happen here? That's one thing you can think a bit about while we actually run the simulation. How do you expect the propagation to, to look now? Let us actually find out. So plotting the output here. Let's see what we get. So in this case, we start out as before with a hyperbolic secant pulse, but then instead of just remaining constant, it actually squeezes into a big spike, which then broads out into another hyperbolic secant pulse, which then squeezes into another spike, and then it keeps repeating like so. And you see we actually get one, two and a half repetitions because I chose this fiber to have a length of 2.5 of these characteristic lengths here. 
So it's kind of novel that we get this uh, spike here. But in order to better understand why that happens, I've created an animation showing how the chirp and the pulse amplitude changes over time. So here we see that because we have more surface modulation, the uh, red chirp gets generated in the front and the blue chirp gets generated in the back. But then a normal dispersion kicks in and causes the blue light to pull ahead of the red light and the red light to trail behind. So that actually causes them to sort of switch places. But now the blue light in the front will get sort of neutralized because now you have a forward slope here that causes the light to become more red and the red light in the back becomes more blue. And then the whole process just resets and repeats like so. So again, we generate blue light in the back that starts to pull ahead and red light in the front that starts to trail behind. And then once they reach their final destination, they sort of get uh, neutralized by surface modulation and we just keep repeating like this. So it's maybe a bit unexpected and very cool that we can get pulses that don't just like either spread out or stay the same, but actually have this kind of oscillating breathing behavior as they propagate further and further down the fiber. Note also that we get this interesting big spike in the power here and a reduction in the pulse duration. That might be useful if you're doing some kind of extreme photonics and want to generate really high power pulses. This sort of way you can take a broad pulse and like squeeze it together even more in the time domain. So, of course, now that we've increased the power a little bit, the very natural question is what happens if we increase the power even more? So to figure that out, that out, let's increase the power to three here and maybe also bump up the number of steps in the fiber because, of course, when we have more uh, non-DRLC, we also need smaller steps in order to model it correctly. So let's run this and also look at the outputs. Now think a bit about what you expect the outputs to look like. Now they have even more power. It's kind of an interesting little thought experiment. So let's take a look at how it actually appears. So now we first get another big spike as before, but instead of simply returning to hypothetic secant pulse, it actually divides itself into two bumps like so, which then seem to merge back into a big spike, which then seems to turn into a hypothetic secant pulse again. So once again, to understand that in a bit more detail, I've created an animation that hopefully demonstrate what's going on. So once again, we get red chips with forward slopes and blue chips with four backward slopes, and the blue light starts to propagate ahead. But now we still have enough slope here to actually generate some more blue light that starts to move to the, the left, more red light that starts to go to the right. So we get another big spike here. Now all the blue lights has traveled to the left-hand side, all the red lights travel to the right. That then gets neutralized by self phase modulation, causing the whole process to just repeat once again. There we go. Okay, and again, of course, now we've tried to increase the power a bit more, the natural thing to do is, of course, to increase the power once again. So let's try and see what happens if we choose n equal to 4. I'm just going to play the animation here directly. So in that case, we can see once again get blue light in the back, red light in the front, and all the blue light starts to push ahead. Now we have so much light here that we get another round of chirp being generated, and then we get actually three bumps now in the middle. And we can generally see that more and more that the blue light is shifting to the the left, so now we get another two spikes here, and now we should get another final big spike here. And now, finally, all the blue lights to the left, all the red lights to the right. And then, surface rotation will just neutralize it, causing the whole process to simply start over. And this is gonna essentially keep happening if you select higher and higher values of uh, n. Of course, with more and more intermediate spikes happening in between, so there's a lot of kind of interesting dynamics going on here with these higher order solitons. What else can we check out? Well, one question you might ask is, what happens if we choose a very small value of n? Well, in that case, we simply don't have enough self phase modulation for it to be balanced out by group velocity dispersion. In that case, group velocity dispersion sort of wins, and the pulse just spreads out, which is a little bit boring. But what happens if we don't choose an integer value of n? What if you pick something a bit more intermediate, like, let's say, 1.2 or something? So if you do that, let's select this here to be 1.2, and maybe increase the number of steps here a little bit, or rather the length of the fiber, and reduce the number of steps, like so. So now we have fairly low power, so we don't need that many steps to get an accurate simulation. So bring all this, we can take a look at the output. And what we see is we actually get some kind of intermediate behavior between the constant and unchanged n equal to 1 soliton and the sort of oscillating n equal to 2 soliton. It's as if in this picture we have sort of a n, n equal to 1 soliton that's kind of constant and then a small oscillation sitting on top of it because of the partial n equal to 2 soliton. So some of an in-between behavior. And of course, that'd be a little bit more complicated if we choose a higher value of n, but I think you get the, the sort of general idea. So that was just a quick demonstration of how solitons work. Feel free to check out the source code in the description and stay tuned for more videos. Bye-bye.